Welcome to Dubrovnik, where we're kicking off the second season of Telecast at New Europe Market, the leading TV industry event in the Central and Eastern European region. TV industry professionals from free-to-air networks, pay TV channels, cable and satellite operators, production, distribution and technology companies are gathered in the Dubrovnik Palace Hotel at one of the first real-life events following the pandemic. So the sun is out, the sky is blue, COVID tests are done, and we're ready for three days of panels, networking and parties, as executives from all over the world come together to discuss the latest business trends, attend keynotes, screenings and do deals against the stunning backdrop of the Adriatic. Telecast, the TV industry news review. On this week's show, I'm joined by Gabor Fischer, Programming Director at Hungary's TV2 Media, and Vlad Ryashin, President of Russia's Star Media. Plus, I'll be grabbing a quick chat with delegates from all around the world to discuss not only the CEE region, but the wider industry as we head into the ever-important fall period. And I chat with piracy expert Tim Pearson to ask what can be done about the issue that has perhaps become more prevalent in this region than many others. But first, let's talk about what it's like to get back to international business travel and attend TV market events now that we're all pretty much resigned to the fact that COVID's here to stay. I've had reports of the hit and miss experience of saliva testing at Cannes Film Festival and issues with online systems frustrating the market experience at a number of other events. So what's it like actually producing an international event under COVID conditions? Well, I caught up again with NEM organiser Sanya Lubicic to see how the event came together. So welcome back to the show, Sanya. Thanks for making time in your really busy schedule for this uh, conversation. So here we are in Dubrovnik in the old town uh, at NEM. How challenging has it been? to put the market on together. We spoke about four weeks ago, the last show before we took our uh, August break. How how challenging has it been in those last four weeks to put this this incredible event on? Thank you for the kind words. It is an incredible event, right? Because it's in an incredible place with incredible people. And it's always challenging, pandemic or not. It's always challenging. It's a lot of work and a lot of fine-tuning. There's obviously a a natural resistance for people to come to industry events, and yours is the first really sort of, um, I think, you know, pan-genre international market that's that's happened in the last 18 months. So so can you take me through some of the challenges that you've had in, in putting this together? Or there are too, there are too many. I can see you're shaking your head. There are too many, right? No, there are too many. And it was not challenging inviting people, if you are thinking about that. No, that was not the challenge. The challenge was to organize everything in a pandemic way. Yeah with distancing and disinfectants, but everybody is vaccinated. Yeah. So the media are a very special group and they get it and they get vaccines. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So that that's a starting point, right? Everybody's doubly vaccinated. Yes. And then everybody's also got to prove their negative to actually fly to get here and travel yes. to get here and also to test to actually get into yes. the event so there's and so there are people from the states there are people from all over europe yeah so countries with more cases and less cases with stricter measures but they're all here yeah so they made an extra effort because they wanted to be here. Yeah. And I I love them all for it. Yeah. Our listeners can tell from the buzzy atmosphere we're here at the uh, at the party on the uh, uh, on the Tuesday evening. But it's also been quite a buzzy atmosphere in the market as well. You know, it's it's been great to see people getting back and I, I know it sounds a simple thing but just getting back and doing face to face those half hour meetings, pitching meetings, you know. And I yes. think Genuinely, people seem to be uh, quite invigorated by that. Yes. It gives you 
an added energy that we all a bit lost in this year and a half. And we were, some of us, depressed. I know I was. And this is like an injection of life that somehow everybody is so happy. Yeah. And they say distancing. We all hugged. Yeah. The first question is, are you vaccinated? Yes. Okay, come here. Yeah. So we hugged. And people are really genuinely happy. And there's over 500 delegates uh, yes. here from all over the world, as you yes. say. And some amazing sessions. We've had the zone. We've got all three media here. We've got representatives from all across the world. So it's, it's great to see that. So maybe this is a bit early to ask you, but uh, what about NEM Zagreb? When, when does that happen in the calendar? And, and will that be happening? Yeah, in the calendar, it's in December. Well, I don't know if we'll have it this year, I'm not sure. I think not, because it would be too close to this one that we had to move because yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah. So, and it would uh, all have to be indoors, whereas, uh, uh, you know, yes. what's, what's unusual about this event is so many panels outside and a lot of it is in the open air, which is... Uh, well, we try to follow everything all the governments are saying. Yeah. Get outdoors get distancing. Well, we hugged, but what yeah. can you do? Yeah, yeah. When we last spoke on, on telecast, you were talking about Pig Box and you were talking about the uh, Save the World from Your Couch campaign. Forgive me if I got the name of that wrong. How's Pig Box doing? How's that affected, you know, the overall uh, brand of Big Box? And is it, you know, you, you presumably you're back to sort of normal business, if you like, on that SVOD service. How's, how's, how's things working out there? Well, we never stopped with normal business. And, you know, like SVODs go, it's ups and downs, more and less. But we never stopped working normal. So we acquire the normal amount of uh, money. No content for us yeah. that we usually acquire it's doing well considering that we're in the Balkans and Bulgaria yeah. so it's 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 doing okay. okay it's not like wow it's amazing yeah but everybody knows us everybody knows we're good yeah. All right. so it's up and down okay well, listen, thank you so much. You're incredibly busy. This is your event. You've got pig box. You've got your translation business as well. So I, I grabbed you for five minutes. Thank you so much for spending thank the you. time. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. We'll speak soon, I hope. My next guests on the show represent two of the key players in the CEE region. Gabor Fischer is Programming Director at Hungary's TV2 Media, one of the leading commercial TV channels in Hungary, and Vlad Ryashin, president of Russia's Star Media, who are one of the biggest multi-genre producer distributors in Russia and the Ukraine. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you very much uh, you. for the invitation. Thank you. Great to see you both. This is the very first telecast that we've done in person. We've done 69 over the internet, so it's a pleasure to be with you and, uh, and see you in real life. Gabor, coming to you first, tell us about TV2 Media Group and your role in it. Thank you very much, as I said, for the invitation. It's really a good thing that we can be here. I'm the programming director of uh, TV2 Media Group from 2017. Before that, in uh, 2016, I was promoted to the cable programming director of TV2 Group. Actually, I would like to say a few sentences about uh, TV2 Group. Uh, in our life, uh, 2015 was very important because in the past, TV2 belonged to Prozibun Zatainz Group, but uh, at the end of 2015, a Hungarian guy, a former Hollywood film producer, uh, Andy Voyner, who was, uh, for example, the producer of Terminator, both uh, the channel, and right. uh, they had very big plans to build up a very strong and competitive portfolio. So uh, I got the cable programming director position in 2016. It was so interesting because in the past I worked for uh, all competitors for uh, RTL Hungary and I worked uh, on the cable side. So we launched uh, and we built up many channels. So actually it was a huge challenge to build up again a little bit bigger portfolio. And uh, just a few sentences about uh, Hungary. 
Uh, that time, RTL Hungary was the market leader. They had one big channel, the Terestia, which is RTL Club. And next to they have uh, seven cable channels. Their market share was approximately 30 percent on the market in 2016. Wow. And uh, TV2 Group was almost only 15. So actually, RTL Hungary was double than TV2. Uh, we had one big channel, the TV2, and uh, three uh, cable channels. And uh, 2016 was really crazy. Uh, we launched seven channels within uh, half a year. We made uh, three big repositioning. So at the end of the year, we had uh, 14 channels together with TV2, and uh, we acquired what we could. It was really, really tough period. Mm. Uh, we closed more than 70 different contracts with distributors. Uh, wow. So it was really amazing. Uh, and uh, the turning point was in 2018. And a few years uh, passed, and now TV2 Group is a market leader, actually. So all cable is much uh, stronger and better than the cable portfolio of uh, RTL. Uh, We are market leader uh, with TV2 all day. Group is also market leader. But if I would like to be fully honest, the only thing where we have challenges when we compare uh, TV to prime time with uh, RTL Club prime time, but uh, we are working on it. So as I said, we have many channels. We wanted to cover all of the market with the different genres. So really we have a, a movie channel, a series channel, a secondary commercial channel. We have telenovela channel, another movie channel, retro series, uh, comedy, lifestyle series, two sports channel, oh, uh, one everything. cooking show, one local <laughs> music show, and the kids channel so it was really a i think an experience being a part of this project because we learned a lot we worked a lot and finally the result came so here we are at the moment this well, is tv congratulations that's, thank uh, you very much that's great now in in terms of content that works well on the tv2 channel tell us what works with that particular channel and what are the hungarian audiences liking to to consume Actually, first, I would like to talk about TV2. Uh, In afternoon, we are broadcasting a Turkish series. They work quite well. Uh, After that, we have a news. And in uh, prime time, we are producing many uh, local production. Actually, I'm I'm proud because uh, we are producing really the best brands of uh, the world. Just a few key brands what uh, we are producing for the fall. Uh, Game of Chefs uh, will be on air in uh, two weeks. Uh, we produced Ninja Warrior, Farm VIP. So actually in Hungary, uh, during the weekdays, we had uh, daily programs from mm-hmm. Monday till Friday. Yep. And for the weekend, uh, we are producing the best uh, shows. Uh, Saturday will be the day of the Dancing with the Stars. And uh, Sundays, we are broadcasting your your face sounds uh, familiar. It's really one of the biggest brands of the country. So lots so, of formats. So a lot of formats. It's yeah. quite, quite busy. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Coming to NEM, what content are you now looking to acquire at this market? And, and do you produce original programming as well? So actually, NAM is, yes, as you said, uh, it's important for us. Uh, we have many channels, so we have to feed them up. So actually, I would say we are, uh, I'm not saying that we are buying everything, but, uh, you know, uh, so we are interested about uh, many uh, content. Mostly, uh, TV2 is very important. We have to keep the connections with the big uh, suppliers, with the big distributors. But I think it's a perfect uh, moment that we can catch up, we can keep the relationship uh, with the distributors, with partners. Actually, in the last one and a half years, of course, we made many Zoom meetings, but that's different. So yeah. when you have a nice uh, cocktail party or just uh, talking somebody with the lobby, all the time you can uh, get some kind of information which can be useful uh, for yeah, the makes, future. It makes a difference to be Yeah, person, absolutely. It's, it? it's different. It's part of the life. And uh, we found also in the past few formats based on this uh, information so we are looking actually content for tv2 and i would say opportunities for the future because hungary is quite competitive and all the time the audience needs newer newer formats so we okay. cannot g- get bored never yeah honestly. absolutely How about covid i mean we're talking about obviously we've all been through it it obviously changed a number of different aspects of the industry and different territories how, how did it affect tv2 in the last 18 months? Actually, it was also quite tough and challenging for us. Uh, It started its uh, big impact around uh, 
mid-March in uh, 2020. Uh, first, uh, we had to stop everything. Of course, we had to organize all of the company went home. And you know, when you are mm. uh, broadcasting many channels, it's a quite big challenge that everybody is working at home. And meanwhile, as we stopped the shows, we had to think on how we can start them again. Uh, and that time, nobody knew what will happen with COVID, what will be the future. Mm. And, you know, the TV is, is difficult because today you are talking about something, you have to order the things, you have to uh, make contracts with suppliers, with people. And it's difficult when you don't know what's happening in the future. Mm. And if you don't make a decision in April, May about the four grid, the four programming strategy, mm. there will be a point where nothing will be on air. The only a few negative things that we uh, planned some big shows. Uh, we wanted to produce uh, Peking Express. It's like a travel reality show to the Philippines. And okay. we realized in May that uh, one thing that we would like to do, but it's physically impossible. Yeah. So we had a quite different uh, fall, but sooner or later we were able to restart uh, the productions. Uh, and you're back in are. full swing now. Yes, in yes, 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 yes. Okay. Obviously, we saw the rise of SVOD and AVOD in particular, changing the market in territories all around the world. I'm presuming it was the same in uh, in Hungary? I think it will be also the future. Uh, regarding TV2 Group, we launched our uh, digital platform. It's called uh, TV2 Play uh, this February. Uh, we just launched its uh, application just a few weeks ago. It's based on a uh, AVOD platform. Uh, this belongs to a digital department of uh, TV2 Media Group. We have some plans. Uh, these are a little bit confidential at the moment, but uh, we know that's uh, part of the future. Of course, we will consider the s vote so we are working on it. So it's all also right. well, important. Good. All the best with that. And, Thank you very much. And in terms of markets, we're, we're here in Dubrovnik. What other markets will you be planning to attend between now and the end of the year? We really hope that MIPCOM will happen only four weeks and uh, we should travel. If it's happening, we are planning to go there. I think it's uh, important for the market because, as I told you previously, everybody can organize Zoom meetings uh, and similar uh, Teams meeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. But we need a personal uh, relationship. We have to we have to keep the connections, and I really hope that because what we have seen at NAM, they organized on a very very a professional way for example the welcoming party was outside on the rooftop so i think we can uh, do it so I, I hope that mipcom will happen and in this case tv2 media group will definitely to join it and here we are i think so this yeah. will be the main event for us this okay. year well it was great that there was an outdoor panel last night which is the first time yes yes, I've yes, seen yes an yes. outdoor panel which is uh, it's got to be the future i think vlad welcome to the show you've just come in from venice right so you've yeah. been at the venice film festival straight to NEM, and you're obviously from Moscow uh, in terms of your, your business. So that's uh, that must have been quite problematic, doing all those flights and going in and out of different territories and, and markets. How was that? How has the experience of traveling been for you? Thank you very much for the invitation. It's, uh, uh, I have a really very interesting trip because I came from Moscow to Venice. Uh, after two days, uh, today I, I came uh, to, uh, to Dubrovnik, and uh, the day after tomorrow I'm going to Kiev. Uh, so, uh, so during one week uh, for cities, and of course, in the time of COVID, it's a very interesting experience. So all of us, we need making uh, tests each yeah. two, three days. Yeah. So it's like uh, going to the office, you know? Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. So tell us about Star Media then. Give us a background to the business and how it's developed over the years. Yeah, this year we are celebrating an anniversary, 15 years of Star Media in the market. Of course, uh, my previous experience helped uh, in the setup of the company because I started my career in the television more than 30 years ago, Right uh, back in the uh, 1990s. Uh, I was an author, host and producer of a different project. My first project was a musician program, musician show, which called Melorama in a small <laughs> commercial station in the Zaporozhye city in Ukraine. After that, in 1996, I started to work in uh, Ukrainian national television channel Inter, and uh, going through, I think, uh, all steps uh, at the channel. At the beginning of millennium, hmm. uh, I started to be a chairman of the board of Inter TV channel. But uh, the, the history of Star Media uh, began in uh, 2006. Uh, today, Star Media is a producer, distributor, and uh, of uh, 
of different kind of uh, television content. We produce in series, documentaries, feature films, and so on. And of course, we started some years ago to co-produce uh, and to make a production projects with different uh, partners in Europe. Uh, and our last uh, project, uh, which we appreciated, uh, is the it's uh, another business model. Is we organize service. Uh, for the Netflix uh, and so the uh, feature film, uh, which will which will were uh, the Netflix at the end of July, with the star in uh, Jean Claude Van Damme, right? Uh, the Last Missionary. Uh, so this film uh, of uh, all shooting service uh, in Ukraine uh, organized our company. All right. So it's uh, another uh, type of uh, of business for us, but uh, anyway. Uh, this uh, film uh, is really very nice. <clears throat> now we uh, collaborate with the leading TV channels in Russia and Ukraine with streaming services. Uh, we develop our own pay TV channels mm -hmm. three years ago, and they're working now. Uh, we being the largest content aggregator in CIS countries uh, in YouTube. We have a multi-channel net in YouTube. It's more than 65 channels. And for more than 26 million subscribers. Right well, now. it sounds like you've got it all sewn up, Vlad. It's incredible. The, uh, so you, you're actually producer, distributor. Yeah. You actually have your, you're an aggregator and you have yes. your own. Uh, yeah. We try to diversify well. our business model. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, I think it's very important uh, in, the, in, in, in such period like, like today. You recently made the move into docudrama. Tell us about that. Yeah. One of our departments are specialized in docudramas and one of our. Biggest, most popular, I mean, uh, of the drama of uh, is the uh, eight hours uh, uh, series The Romanovs. We sold it more to 100 countries around the world. Right. You can find it in Amazon Prime, for example, yep. and uh, for, uh, in a lot of different streamers, uh, also services. Yeah, we're making a lot of uh, reconstructions uh, for, for our docudramas dramas uh, and uh, for. Uh, Honestly speaking, now we're uh, thinking uh, to make a special Bay TV channel, uh, which is specialized uh, on our docudramas, historical mm. series. I'm sure that we will have special uh, handle our new OTT platform, which we launch uh, this month. Right. It's absolutely fresh news because it's uh, going to the to the like press release uh, yesterday, okay. honestly speaking, and uh, until the end of September, uh, we started to to be at the smart TV in, in iOS and Android, in Roku, okay. and so on, uh, in uh, 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 around the world, uh, uh, in our streaming service, which called Lava. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, do you know that Lava is a, uh, uh, one of the word uh, which uh, uh, mean the same in all languages uh -huh. okay. uh, in Russian in English I think in Hungarian too so the lava from Volcania yeah uh, so yeah. lava lava yes uh -huh. okay all right so, so well, this is the name of our new streaming service and our worldwide new brand yes all right <laughs> well, well we'll put links in the episode description to both the TV2 play and to lava as well so everybody can go go there and have a look at that what about projects that you're developing and producing right now? Tell us, tell us what's going on. Tomorrow will be the premiere uh, at, here at uh, NEM uh, of our uh, co-production project, which we, uh, the name of this project is, is uh, Silence. It will be part as of uh, Better Night. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked on it together with uh, our partners, the Croatian uh, company Drugi Plan. The German uh, distributor Beta Film, yeah, uh, and the Ukrainian streaming service All TV. It is directed by Dalibor Matanic. By the way, he was recently awarded uh, on Series Mania in the International okay. Panorama, right, uh, for his uh, new project. So uh, now we are in post production. I invited you tomorrow to the Beta Night uh, premiere to have a look uh, this first episode of this six hours uh, series. Uh, this is one of our important projects. Another one, it's a unique and uh, amazingly true to fact documentary film, which called Bolshoi, uh, Rise and Fall Behind the Curtain. Okay. Uh, and uh, we produce it in partnership with the international company Kinescope Film, it's a German company, mm -hmm. Arte, Zalzeber, 
Uh, and it, it is a story about the offstage life of the best known Russian theater. Bolshoi, Bolshoi Theater. Yeah. Oh, yes. Right. So we're following uh, uh, Bolshoi during the year. So we started on September last year. Right. And we uh, stopped at August this yeah. year. So during one year, we shooting, uh, we shoot it all days, uh, all uh, preparations, all premieres of Bolshoi Theater. That's, that's amazing access. Yeah, that you yeah. Have, I, yeah. I, I hope that uh, it will be very interesting. And uh, I, I, I hope that it will be also not only the streaming, uh, streaming services, not only the TV channels uh, uh, like Arte, for example, but also maybe in the theaters. Yeah. I hope. Okay. Uh, I hope. Yeah. Uh, you, you can find it. It is now um, at Netflix, so you can find it. Uh, uh, what you cannot find right now, but we are working on it uh, together with the French partners. Uh, uh, we are working on a new feature film, which called uh, Shtetl. Uh, Shtetl is the in uh, uh, in Jewish. It's uh, like small village, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it is feature film which we uh, uh, shoot it uh, some months ago in Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it was by, by the real story uh, of, uh, it was the village, uh, Jewish village uh, on the, the, on the border of Ukraine with Poland b b before the World War II uh, come into the, uh, to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, and the story happens during one day uh, on the 21st of, September, of uh, June. 22nd, you know, the Germans uh, started, uh, they right. attacked. Yeah. Uh, and uh, during one day, this, this story happened and finished when Germans came. All right. Uh, and uh, this uh, amazing story is directed by French director Eddie Walter. Uh, it's a story of love and friendship uh, be, 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 between young people in a small, this shtetl Jewish town. Uh, the deep thing in, in this film that, of course, uh, we, we we all of us we need to and COVID time also uh, proved that uh, this is a real thing uh, that we need to to, to 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 live all our day like the last one. You're right. It's it's really opened our eyes to to I think you know how we live our lives. Um, now. Talking about uh, formats, we were talking about formats earlier on with Gabor. You've recently just joined Frapper. You seem to have all of the bases covered and obviously in formats as well. So tell us about your ambitions in formats as well. During the last 15 years, uh, we adapted more than uh, 20 uh, scripted formats, including uh, Mistresses and Dr. Forrest from BBC, The Closer and Mentalist from Warner Brothers. Mm. Uh, Fox is Awake, which is now in Russian uh, uh, biggest uh, streaming uh, platform, uh, Evie. Uh, our adaptation, I mean, uh, now is uh, there. Uh, and Medium from CBS also now, now is in production. Uh, and currently, uh, for one of our flagship shows uh, is in adaption of Israeli drama Your Honor. Uh, which you uh, could see uh, the Showtime, uh, American version, Israeli version, and uh, now we're um, uh, at the final stage of shooting our own version with uh, uh, one of the biggest star Russian stars, uh, Oleg Menshikov, uh, as the main hero. So, and uh, I hope that uh, it will be a big success. We uh, are making our original uh, formats uh, available for adaptation, like Detective Anna, which is a big hit uh, at the Amazon Prime now. Uh, Live after life, go dance, uh, and, and, and so on. So, for speaking about Frappa, I also have to say that uh, at the beginning of this year, we started our own anti-piracy service, uh, which called uh, Content Scan. Now we making anti-service uh, this anti-piracy service for more than forty different partners, uh, especially in Russia and Ukraine and CIS mm. countries. But now we also speaking with some Hollywood studios, uh, with some big companies, and uh, also discuss with Netflix because we have seen how many uh, links uh, mm. for the. Uh, last missionary uh, we can found in yeah. we found in uh, in Russia and Ukraine, for example. For us, uh, you know, uh, anti piracy of, uh, is uh, one of the main directions. We understanding that all of us, all of our legal producers, who wants to create uh, with the talented directors, actors, scriptwriters, 
talented shows. Of course, we need to monetize. Monetize. We we need to to work in the legal in the legal world. Of course, yeah. Well, I, we're also going to be talking to Tim Pearson, uh, who's a piracy expert uh, elsewhere on the show. So it's, we know it's a it's a key issue for uh, Central and Eastern Europeans industry. So talking about NEM, you're here direct from Venice. What are your key objectives in Dubrovnik? Participation in uh, NEM uh, is not our first experience. Honestly speaking, we are always glad to collaborate and ready to support uh, panel discussions here. Uh, share our experience and find new international partners. And I'm very glad when I came uh, after the plane, uh, my first steps uh, in this uh, hotel, uh, the market, and I have seen my friends. Uh, it's Dariusz Jablonski, uh, famous Polish producer and director, mm-hmm. and my partner of uh, my previous co-production, our previous co-production project, uh, The Pleasure Principle, which we produced with him and with uh, Czech television, uh, and it was on the air. Uh, at, at Arte, at Rai in Italy, in uh, Canal Plus in Poland, and One Plus One in Ukraine, and uh, Nibojša uh, f- uh, from Drugi Plan uh, from Croatia, mm-hmm. and some guys from Beta Film who are also here. Yeah. So, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, 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 I have to say that uh, uh, our project, uh, Silence, which I uh, explained about that mm-hmm. uh, before, <clears throat> of, uh, it, it born here. Not here, but in Zagreb, but at, at the NAM. Oh, really? Last year, yes. Uh, we see, we, we uh, sit it uh, with a cup of coffee with Nibojša, with uh, guys from uh, Better Film. Mm-hmm. And Nibojša told about this uh, IP, which he found because uh, our series based on, uh, on the one hand on real stories, but on the other hand by, by the books. Yeah. And uh, he told us this story. Uh, and uh, both of us, uh, our company, me uh, personally, and guys from Betafilm, uh, said, "Look, it's very, very interesting. So maybe we can uh, we can develop and we can start it to do." And now, after uh, not one, two years ago, mm. uh, and after two years, uh, now the premiere of the first episode will be also at the NEM. So yeah, this is for us NEM. Well, that's a that's a good case study there for Sanya and the uh, NEM team. And now it's that time in the show where my guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they're telling to get in the bin. Gabor, who's your hero of the week? For me, the hero of the week, I think the Hungarian Paralympics uh, team because uh, it just finished and Hungary achieved uh, 60 medals, uh, 7 gold, uh, 5 silver and 4 bronze. And I think it's a great result because Hungary is not a big country. And finally, uh, we achieved the 18 positions uh, among the countries. So I think all of the Hungary is really uh, proud of uh, about our team. So yeah. for me, they are the story of the week. Yeah. So you should be proud of them. That's a uh, fantastic achievement. And who or what are you telling to get in the bin? I would uh, mention myself because... Uh, oh, you're, you're throwing yourself in the yeah, bin. Yeah, yeah, I should, honestly. So everybody uh, mentioning that how important is the market. And I have to tell you a story. Uh, we had a flight yesterday from Vienna to Dubrovnik. We left uh, Budapest and after uh, 30 minutes, my girlfriend just called me that maybe with big chance uh, her uh, key is in my luggage. And I had to stop oh, and I noticed it was no. true. So can you imagine when she said uh, she has a very important meeting with someone yeah. and I closed the door so I have to come back. And uh, meanwhile, as I finish this conversation, I have to notice the faces of my colleagues who uh, <laughs> consider there is a big chance that we will miss the plane in uh, Vienna. So first I had to tell, don't worry, I'm uh, controlling the situation. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, I have to see that they were really, really worried about that there is a huge chance yeah. that we will miss it. So I had to <laughs> run back and uh, I just put uh, into the GPS that Vienna airport and it was quite tough. But finally, we were uh, at the gate uh, five minutes before it was closed, so we we could manage. But I think so. I have to I have to uh, nominate myself to okay. this position, honestly. Well, uh, that is the first self nomination. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so congratulations to that, and and I'm glad that you you uh, yeah, yeah, you caught yeah, the finally. flight. Finally, you caught the flight, and uh, I mean that's the joys of international travel again, right? Yes. So yes. Uh, so how about you, uh, Vlad? Who's your hero of the week? 
My hero of the week is uh, our director of our show, The Silence, Dalinor Matanic, uh, uh, because he just got a Grand Prix award uh, at Series Mania International Panorama yeah. with another show, not our, but I hope that maybe next his Grand Prix will be with our show. So uh, anyway, he is my hero of the week. Well, congratulations Thank to you. him. And who or what are you telling to get in the bin? Flag? Oh, we don't know the week uh, uh, for me is uh, uh, our financial manager. She didn't pay in time to one of our very talented director and he was very nervous. <laughs> oh, no. So please, all financial managers, pay in time to these uh, directors. <laughs> Quite right. That's right. We account departments you know when they're late late on paying you know when you're in service business yeah it's uh yeah we all know that feeling listen vlad gabor thank you so much for coming on the show really enjoyed uh, speaking to you good luck at the market it's been really fascinating to hear about star media and tv2 good luck we'll see you very soon thank you very much thank Hope you the same thank you. you thank you well, I said we'd have some international guests as well as those from the Central and Eastern European region. It's always great when you come to a market and you bump into a familiar face. And I'm delighted to bump into Paul Heaney, CEO of Bossa Nova. Paul, how are you? Yeah, lovely to see you. Yeah, no, I'm very well, thank you. Very well. No, lovely to see you. Isn't it good? We did bump into each other literally yesterday. So. We did, yeah. yeah. And we're here in, you know, literally just paint the scene. You can obviously hear in the background there's party going on. There is a pool. We're next to the pool, but, you know, we are obviously fully attired, you know, in business attire. What's it been like setting up a brand new distribution business in the middle of <laughs> lockdown? <clears throat> it's been absolute hell. There's no other way of describing it. Anyone who says, oh, yeah, but there are challenges, we rose to them. Sorry about that. Yeah, but it was, it was hell. And I must admit, the first three, four, five months even were just so hard. It was like running through treacle uphill, if that isn't if I hadn't mixed my metaphors, which I possibly have. But it was just so tough. And I'd say from sort of March, April, it's been brilliant. And isn't it funny how time moves on, time heals? I only look back when someone asks me to look back. Otherwise, God, it sounds like I'm some sort of self-help book available in good bookshops. Now, it does sound a bit like that, but actually you move on so quickly. I didn't think I could, didn't think I would. But actually, um, Bossanova has been a godsend and I'm really grateful for setting it up now and to all the help I've had in, in doing it and all the support I've had from producers and buyers. So, um, and I'll make sure we repay that. The industry as a whole, uh, we can all sort of just get a little bit more positive now. We're coming into a more positive time. And I think um, I just thought, why wouldn't I go to the first face-to-face -face market that there's been for a year and three quarters? Okay, it's not in the most fashionable part of Europe, but then anyone who knows me knows I'm not one of the most fashionable people. Well, I'd argue with that, but you know, that's their, their opinion. Without uh, exception, when things happened with Q, and we're not going, we won't go go into those, but no, we can. We're happy to if you want to. Yeah, you have. For me, everybody that I spoke to. Uh, when you were going through all this has had an enormous amount of respect for what you've done and you know built up a business then obviously you know gone to bed with, uh, with a partner that uh, uh, possibly wasn't the best partner <laughs> for you um but now and again i'm mixing my metaphors you hit the canvas or whatever but you're back in the ring very much so and 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 fighting and it is great to see you here at a market getting on with it tell us a bit about bossa nova then tell us about how, you know what the setup is and and what your vision for the company is yeah i think um we came up with a strap line of uh, and thank you for those words by the way that's very kind of you and um any goodwill uh, is gratefully received and i like to try and reciprocate that that's the way i think we should all be coming out of this um, it was a horror story that that um, December to June time last, you know, December 19 to June 20 was was horrific. However, look what else happened during that time to a lot of other people. So, you know what? It feels a little bit self-indulgent. Um, yes, shit happens, and it did happen. But a whole load of other shit happened, which was far worse to a lot of other people. So. To be honest with you, yes, it did. And, and that, that old adage of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger absolutely applies to that period. And you said about hitting the canvas and you're back in the ring. 
Uh, let's go. Let's let's carry on the mixed metaphors. Now I'm. Um, I feel like I've gone back into the bear pit. It feels like it's a sort of like. Um, you know, you just have to go down there and uh, and you're out there challenging for shows and challenging for rights and uh, and getting close to broadcasters again and listening to them and not listening to them and then pretending that you're listening to them. But no, you are listening to them. But I'm just saying. You have to go back at everyone, and you have to challenge everyone. You have to say, right, okay, you know, do you really need all those rights? Can we work a different way? You know, every single model that we've ever worked with before, in terms of distribution agreements and license agreements, is up in the air. And I think with Bossa Nova, I've got a, an ideal opportunity to just not not deliberately rip everything up and start again. Though that is a lovely, lovely thing to be able to do. Sometimes I must admit. It's very liberating to be able to just say, fuck it, why don't we just do it this way? But at the same time, so we've taken on Jasmine Joseph as marketing manager who arrived in October. And Jazz has been amazing, as sort of basically, you know, as a 24-year-old, she's incredible and she knows it, hopefully. I only tell her every day, most of the time. But I think, um, you know, Jazz really has, has sort of got us moving fast and then uh, we've just two months ago we picked up um, Tatiana Kostovsky, uh, who uh, was at Banerjee, a breath of fresh air, someone I hadn't worked with before. So I love that combination now of Jasmine, oh, I worked with at, uh, at TCB for, uh, for four years, um, maybe slightly more. And she was a callow 19-year-old and now is like, um, you know, world-weary 24-year-old. She isn't. But I think um, having a combination of people that I've worked with before and people that I haven't is really good. Saying that, there's nothing wrong with TCB. You know, someone says it's TCB Mark II. I'm very happy with that. But it isn't. It's just bossing over. And we're going to look at it differently. And we say about the... Uh, you know, the, a new wave in distribution. I do believe that. I do believe that it's time now to, we have to take it on the chin, but we've got to take on a lot more risk. There's no getting away from that. And I'm also looking to help mentor and coach as many people as I can because of what I've been through as well. So if there are other distributors out there who are worried, I can help. You know, and I know the small to mediums, uh, it's all a very, very, very competitive world, but distributors used to talk to each other. We used to collate and sort of collaborate and cooperate oh there's lots of co-words in there but uh, it's almost like it was planned but we can do that you know we can but it's just a fearful paranoid world it's probably not likely to happen but there are lots of lessons learned that I've learned that I know now that having the reset button I was able to push has been has been a massive bonus how do you set up a post-covid distribution business from scratch and how do you do it differently? That's the other thing, because what are the, are, are the rules different now? We were 21 million turnover with 21 people, actually, more or less, by the end of 19, more or less. So I think what you do is you have a very lean operation, and that's nothing against the, the stars that were at TCB. And I think, you know, hopefully all of them, and I'm in touch with most, if not all of them, uh, most of the time, is that they should all take a bow, because they should all be proud of what they did, and I hope that the legacy, or whatever you now call TCB, is um, stays on because we did things really cleverly. We took some risks. Not all of them paid off. Um, the nails weren't ready to be, um, you know, sort of put into the coffin of TCB, but it did happen. It was sort of, you know, moved on as a brand. But now we've got the chance to learn what we did before, have a much leaner team. We don't need as big a team now because, of, yeah, we're all learning. All businesses are learning about how many people you can have in a business. You know, we're now Soho-based, uh, which apparently I'm now learning that central London is the centre of London rather than West London, which for 21 years I thought West London was the centre of London. And it's, it took me a while to work that one out. And geography was never my strong subject at school. I think lean is the key. Uh, everything we ever did, I'm just questioning. And I think, you know, we don't want to change for the sake of change, but everything. How big a sales team do you want? How do, how do you want acquisitions to work with sales? How do you want finance and HR and marketing and business affairs? How do you want that to work? How do you want it to liaise with each other? So for the first time, um, and I'm getting on a bit, there's no doubt about that. You know, hopefully it's, um, um, most of the meetings I'll have soon will be in the dark. This has been a chance to just completely um, start again. And I've really, really raised it. So sorry, the long answer to the short question, Justin, is just start very lean. Um, also, the other thing I'd say is forget catalogues, forget building up, building up. Though, listen, we've got the CJZ Greenstone catalogue, which has been 
a massive godsend not just to, to me as the first salesperson but also to Tatiana as the second salesperson um, joined as well because now she now has content to sell that's ready now whereas when you're building up a content that you want straight away it takes a bit of time I don't want to do what we did before which was maybe take on one too many fishing series sorry about that ex-colleagues you know, maybe we did that and now's the chance that we can actually just look at it and you know the, the world isn't just premium I think that's the other thing we're not just we can't we can't get seduced too much by the um, the, the, uh, the non-linear market to say oh my god we all want premium that's not the way the world is right now we have to respond to what is in front of us what's in front of us is a non-linear and a linear uh, market so let's go for so one to four parters you know medium budget small budgets large budgets on that side let's go to to returnable repeatable scalable my favorite phrase thank you charlie parsons at nat geo for giving me that one you talk about risk and you mentioned risk earlier on. Now, you've had investment as well in the business, haven't you? Yes. So what was the thinking behind that? Is that presumably to get to 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds? Or what, what's, what's, t- tell, me, tell me about that. No, it absolutely wasn't. I mean, I want to do 0 to 60. Um, if you want to, look, you started the car analogy now, so yeah. I'm going to have to let that one out. Yeah. I'll have to, I'm, I'm, I'm doing 0 to 60 in an Austin 1100, possibly, um, uh, that's, that's had better days that's maybe done 260,000 miles I'm sorry to stay, or maybe even a VW Combi now I want to do 0 to 60 let's just do it if we see an opportunity we'll go for it if we want to grow we'll grow quickly but the brilliant thing about meeting the night train guys and I don't know whether it's uh, whether it's night train the philosophy there versus the way the Anglo-Saxon way which is build a company up pull it quickly and sell it which is what I've been used to in the past this is all about let's grow a business and actually enjoy it. What does investment deliver? A pot of cash in the bank, but what, what does it deliver from a strategic perspective for you? I've invested a lot of money into Boston Over already. So I wanted an investor to come in and uh, put investment into, uh, into running the business and also then uh, give us um, a pot of money and have a, have a strategy that they would agree with too. Um, just to invest in content, just content, nothing else. So, so um, a completely separate facility, just for content, not a sort of um, to hive off, to sort of pay bonuses or pay for offices. That's just for content. So that was such a brilliant thing that we collaborated on. The actual deal to do this was something that we both worked on, Night Train and Boston Over, and it was it will work really well because they see. The projects that we're working on they're, they're mainly in scripted but there's a sort of trust there and they're very much content people and so far it's working brilliantly they're very very clear parameters about how we work it's early early days but they just want to start this off get the facility working and then let's see what happens in the future maybe you know if we can make uh, the investments that we've d- that we've made turn into a profit or look or look like a healthy investment then who knows you know and I'm not I'm not banking on anything at the moment I want to sashay across the finish line this year end of December with whatever number we get revenue wise um, and not panic too much and then maybe just ratchet up the sort of the um, the pressure on us as, as a team next year but there's no rush I want to enjoy this and, and also I want that to be passed on you know there's a lot of producers out there that need our help I want to make sure we pick the right projects. And if you're doing a if you're doing a sort of mind map, which sadly I often do about the genres that we want to work in, I want to make sure that we pick a, a broad base of genres, but not just because we want to be broad based, because distributors all know to their cost. Is there's no point being broad based if some of those bases out there just don't turn a profit. You know, there's no point in doing it. So we will work to where the profit lines are, but we'll also try and be as broad as possible in terms of genres and subjects, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one last question, because I know, as everyone can probably hear, there's a party going on in the background, and uh, yeah, I don't want to uh, delay you from, from that point. You're here in Dubrovnik at uh, NEM, 
Why? It was an opportunity that I didn't understand why more people didn't take. This is fantastic for people's well-being to be here. We're seeing buyers face to face. We're seeing other distributors face to face. I'm seeing journalists and producers like yourself face to face. Why isn't this a good idea for a few days to come out? I mean, we're busy. Listen, August has been way too busy, in, in my opinion. August is not supposed to be like this, and it was. We're now in September. Um, and MIPCOM looks like it's going to happen much bigger than we initially thought, pending various regulations that are coming. Why wouldn't I? Tatiana's here as a colleague. I wouldn't mind giving her support um, if she needs it, but she hasn't needed it so far, and I don't think she will. But I, um, I just felt it was a, not even a double-edged sword, a triple-edged sword. I think it was many benefits to coming out here for a few days to start talking to people and actually getting back into practice of doing back-to-back -back meetings and maybe multitasking and not just sitting like a Muppet, according to the organiser of this event, in front of Zoom, as she said on your telecast back in July. So um, I thought that was very funny, Muppets. It actually was very descriptive about it looks like the Muppet Show. Not that you look like Muppets, but it looks like the Muppet Show, just in case yeah. that comes across wrong. Just well, I'm, I'm really glad that you did. It's great to, to sit down and have a quick chat, Paul. Thank you for the time. Well, and right. Perhaps we might have a sundown in a minute. Yes. But listen, we are working, though, aren't we, Justin? Yes, very hard. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Cheers. Well, another friendly face that I've bumped into here at NEM Dubrovnik is Maria Rua Aguete from Omdia. How are you, Maria? You've been on the show before. Lovely to see you again. Nice to see you, and uh, nice to see you in this wonderful sunny location, Dubrovnik. So. I know. Let's not rub it in for the listeners at home too much, but we're very lucky to be here, and it's a super event. So obviously you're here having lots of meetings with lots of different businesses from CEE, but you're also moderating a panel called Is Streaming the Future of Sports, which is obviously a really interesting subject and a key area for discussion, one of the members of the, the panel was Peter Parmenta from DAZN, and they did a little keynote, 15 minute keynote, talking about where they are right now and where they're going, which I thought was really, really interesting. Can you just give us a flavor of the panel, uh, what was discussed and, and what the key takeaways were? Yes, thank you. So yes, Peter did this 15 minute keynote and you could see how the audience was so excited to hear about sports, sports content, how passionate, how many emotions sports uh, generates. And they were very excited because sports is one of the critical key rights that people want to have here in the region. Yeah. As two of the panelists said, we have Croatian Telecom, we had A1 Croatia, and we have from Bulgaria, the CEO of Bulsat.com. And they all said, uh, for us, sports is critical and having the rights is important. Sometimes we cannot acquire them ourselves because they're very expensive. So partnering with companies like the song, it will be so important to us. Yeah. So it was interesting how they were the ones asking Peter at the song, Peter, are you interested in partnering with us? Because we know a secret of the success of the company is partnerships around the world with Telefonica, Sky, in Germany, in the US, in Japan, with many companies. What about with the smaller players? What about us in this radio? Mm. And Peter said, of course, it's challenging when you speak. Uh, different countries have different challenges, but he was very open to have conversations with all of them and start partnerships in this region as well. At, at the moment, they're very active in nine countries. They have rights for some sports like boxing in more than 200. Yeah. So Peter again said to the audience, eh, we are super sized in nine countries. We would love to expand to many more. Will any country in Eastern Europe comes next? Who knows? It depends, of course, of the interest and if it makes economic sense as well. And scale, obviously, is really key for the zone, isn't it? Uh, and I mean, I guess it's getting that balance between scale, but also and also the huge very expensive rights, sports rights that they acquire and, and obviously is driving their strategy. So it's interesting to think that you know there could be local players that they, that they might partner with. Of course, and I think he hinted that in the panel. And also we talk not just about life sports, that obviously everyone is crazy about, but what about other types of content around the sports? What about documentaries? What about series around the sports? Yeah. I think Stan from Bulls.com said it himself, uh, sometimes we need to forget about the big life events, Champions League or 
these huge events and think more about local heroes in local countries. Yeah. He in Bulgaria said, what about if we do serious documentaries about our local heroes, not well known outside Bulgaria, but very important for our local audiences. Yeah. So everyone agree that local content is not just for serious drama, also for the world of sports. So it can be a local team from the nation, it can be a very small regional city, uh, city team, so you need to think outside the box, yeah. and that everyone in the panel agree. And another topic that I really like and I would love to say here today, women in sports. Yes. So this saw made this announcement with YouTube, trying to reach new audiences and, and new fans. Uh, they have the rights for the UEFA uh, Women's Champions League. Yeah. Fantastic to promote the women in sports, but it was also interesting how the guys from Croatia said, at the moment, we're not really ready or we don't think there is that appetite for that type of content, but maybe in a couple of years it will be. Yeah. So I think companies like The Song promoting it, is, uh, talking a lot about it in social media, creating noise about this kind of sports will help the whole world to promote other types of sports involving Absolutely. women as well. So I think that, that was another highlight of the show. Partnerships, local content, women in sports. Yeah, ITV, they, they just announced a, a deal for the English Lionesses team yes. uh, recently. And we've seen through cricket in the UK, the 100 has really increased the awareness of women's cricket as well. So. This is a real growth area, right, uh, for women's sport that, that has really largely been ignored, which is which, which is going to re a really exciting new opportunity for broadcasters around the world to perhaps get sports rights for a, for a fast-growing new, uh, new sector. Exactly, and that's why I, th I thought it was fascinating, because uh, when asked the question here in Croatia, uh, I think the telcos were not really prepared or thought about the, how they can monetize women in sports, but this is food for thought. Yes, if someone doesn't start uh, broadcasting it, promoting it, advertising it, using social platforms, social medias, using YouTube, TikTok, and other ways to promote it, yeah. obviously it, it will never grow. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and what we're seeing now, obviously, in the world of sports, particularly football, obviously, is the power of brands now. I mean, Cristiano Ronaldo has got his own brand and Messi, and but also, you know, if you look at Barcelona, Manchester United, hate to say it, but anyway, Manchester yes. United <laughs> and uh, uh, Real Madrid, some of these big brands, you know, their women's Vigo, teams. Just. Yeah, yeah. Uh, their, their, their women's teams, you know, that's yeah. an opportunity for channels to buy into those brands, but also to help this uh, fast expanding area of sport. 100%. So if there are many brands listening to us today, uh, it's something is good to pay attention. Right yeah. now is the right moment yeah. to invest, to promote and to help communities and not just women because again women in sports is not just for a, the audience will not just be women it will be everyone yeah. uh, and attract new generations young people uh, generation alpha yeah uh, everyone so yes uh, i think it was another hot topic in the panel the use of social media the use of tiktok yeah. youtube facebook instagram yeah and as you say the zone Partnering with YouTube yes. for the the Women's Champions League was a was a really interesting a move. So, yeah. so well, it's it's a really fascinating area for discussion. Thank you for sharing the the highlights of uh, of the panel, uh, Maria, and hope to have you on uh, telecast again in the in the near future. I hope so. Looking forward to that. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So piracy is an issue that keeps coming up when discussing the Central and Eastern European TV territories. Vlad mentioned it earlier in the show, and it's also something that's come up for discussion in one or two of the panels here at NEM. So how big a problem is it? And as the industry becomes ever more digital dependent, what can be done about it? I'm joined by Tim Pearson, Senior Director of Solutions Marketing at NAGRA, the provider of content protection and service security, to shed a little light on this. Hi, Tim. Welcome to Telecast. Hi there. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. So, content piracy, how big a problem is it globally, and in particular in Central and Eastern Europe? We've all seen the explosion of, of streaming, um, and, and that's largely been accelerated by, by the pandemic. And, and really, as the industry has gone to OTT and particularly as it's gone direct to consumer, 
uh, we've seen a very fast follow um, for each of those moves by the pirates. So, so as each of those moves moves, and then as as the growth increases as well, then then we continue to see that con- that sort of I guess continuing growth in in piracy as well. Um, and that's that can be driven by any number of reasons. I mean, I think if we look at it from a consumer angle then consumers are, are sort of increasingly subscription stacking. You know, they're taking, they're getting all their content from different sources. And sometimes a frustration can lead to them, you know, taking the path of least resistance. And sometimes that 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 may take them towards a, a piracy site, of which a number are pretty genuine looking um, on the face of it. And then you look at the price and it, like the old adage, if it's too good to be true, it uh, it probably is. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so why does... CEE have such a problem with it. Well, I think if we if we look at if we look at what's what's there, then then really, as I said, consumers tend to take the path of least resistance. Um, and in the in the CEE region, there 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 is does seem to be a particular prevalence of piracy. We were part of a of a case last year that shut down a, a ring or a rapid IPTV ring, um, and as part of that, they offered a number of. Um, CEE bouquets or b- barrels of channels that, uh, that 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 were made available. So, I think in there's there's clearly an, an appetite for for content, and a lot of the piracy is driven by a sort of a question of around content availability versus accessibility, and particularly that can include price. So, I think sometimes then the, that's very much a driver. I think there's also uh, quite a lot of, um, of sort of appetite for pirate content, and and there's, there's some of it is being being created in the region too, and and that's why we're seeing you know efforts uh, and particularly our friends at the United Group really driving uh, a, a sort of an industry coalition to to really address this in the region. How is content pirated then? How sophisticated and organised are? Are pirates today? I mean, I'm sure they're not like got cutlasses and swinging from the yard up. But I mean, what is a pirate operation like? I mean, are they are, are they pretty pretty big concerns? The the swashbucklers are. Uh, it, it's certainly a long way from that. I think that's what everybody always conjures up when you talk about piracy. You think about people in a back bedroom somewhere, like with streaming or copying mm. content. I mean, fundamentally, all piracy starts from an illicit copy somewhere. Now, whether or not it's been restreamed, it's been rebroadcast, what whatever, but that that's where it starts. Instead of that sort of back bedroom analogy, I think piracy today is is pretty much. It large scale organized crime i mean that sounds that's that's a big statement mm. but if we look at some of the cases we've been involved with across europe when the seizure orders go in they they're seizing sort of millions in cash and also sort of large value assets as well you know like cars and properties and so on and so forth so piracy is a sophisticated business there's a lot of the the skill set that that are being used by pirate groups that, that really is very technically adept and so that means that certainly for us in the industry then then keeping one step ahead and helping uh, helping our customers uh, sort of do that through through decent uh, security strategies that include things like watermarking and the anti-piracy services is is absolutely key to to match 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 the pirates mm-hmm. uh, Step by step, if you like. So they must be pretty technically adept because I've, I've seen the number of technology companies that are here at NEM, you know, providing the services to a lot of uh, streaming channels and AVODs and SVODs. There must be an equivalent expertise in the black market, if you like. There, there, unfortunately, there is. And, and there's also, uh, these days, there's, there's a number of sort of, you know, pirate turnkey, ready to go solutions that that are available, which mm. of course lowers that barrier to entry, mm. and means that the the tools to 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 get pirates off and running um, uh, are actually uh, are actually sort of available um, in in certain places, and and that of course means that pirates are able to build some fairly compelling websites. These websites will trick typically. Attract uh, attract consumers. They'll attract people that that it looks genuine. It feels genuine. That you know the, the best ones now have sort of support channels and pop up. You know how can I help you, bots and mm-hmm. and, and all the rest of it. So on the face of it, it's a pretty legitimate type of business. But of course, the risks are are more than uh, for the consumer are more than just having your content turned off when the piracy ring gets shut down because. 
there's quite a lot of the, the piracy uh, applications and that type of thing tend to put additional sort of malware and types of uh, software onto onto the unsuspecting consumer's devices as well. So is the problem getting worse? And if so, why? Well, I think that's it's a great question and one that we we often look at. I mean, if we look at if we look at the overall sort of growth that I touched on right at the top, um, we're seeing we're seeing you know we're seeing more cinema releases go direct to streaming, and and that in, in a, is a particular thing around the, the whole PVOD piece means that whereas at one time your your copy of the latest cinema release would be would be based on you know somebody with a camera in a, in a cinema now it's a it's a fully rendered full scale digital version so in in that regard premium content is obviously getting pirated straight away and we saw recently the release of black widow which which mm. uh, you know was clearly heralded as uh, being pirated in in locations where it was yet to be released let alone um, let alone offered it takes pace and it continues to take pace with the industry and so as the industry changes the the pirates very very quickly follow and as we see that expansion we'll we'll see we'll see it expand as well with more and more digital channels it's presumably easier to pirate from digital as opposed to linear is that a fair comment or yeah, I, I mean fun, fundamentally i don't think there's a lot in it i mentioned unfortunately there's you know you can you can get access to the tools relatively sort of easily for those that, that are intent on doing so what does become relevant is that if you look at it so piracy of linear live sports and that sort of stuff then, then that's really where those those effective content protection measures really need to be in place so so with things like you know like our watermarking and so on and so forth you can quickly detect when when there is a leak and and take very very quick action to 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 address the problem and that's particularly critical when you're talking about live sports and, and all the rest of it where you time really is of the essence yeah yeah so so i mean you you mentioned a couple of you know the the approaches there what what can the industry do about it as um you know as sure, surely as piracy gets more sophisticated the the you must have more effective systems being developed to stay one step ahead of them no absolutely i mean i think the first thing to say is that with piracy it's it's no single fix i don't think any organization is 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 able to to fix it completely themselves it it relies on these industry collaborations and consortia that, that i mean we're a member of here in europe in in latin america and also also in asia and and in those consortia, each partner brings very much their own expertise, and that comes across vendors such as ourselves. It comes across content owners, content producers, law enforcement agencies. So the uh, the recent case I touched on, um, the Rapid IV TV case, you know, we were working with, with Eurojust and Europol, and, and, and you know the the sort of the the main sort of bodies as well as the content owners and the rights holders and and so on and so forth. And with Nagra, we're we're looking or our intelligence systems are continually scanning for where these pirate sites are, Hmm. um, what they're doing. And then we take that and a whole load of other data to conflate it um, and really build a relationship map of, of how everything fits together. And then when you take that and you add it to, to some of the information from the content producers and then share that with the law enforcement people, that's how you then build that overall, that overall picture. Well, I'm sure we'll do a full show dedicated to the issue. I know we, we, we're just having a quick chat now, but I, I, I know that uh, that it's a big issue, not just in this region, but all around the world. I'm sure we could go into a lot uh, more detail in it. But in the meantime, thanks, Tim, for giving us a glimpse of the problem and what might be done to address it. No problem. Happy to be here. Thanks very much. Well, that's about it for this week's show. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of the real-world market experience. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And a quick reminder to sign up for our free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you might have missed, downloadable reports and surveys, and exclusive insight and opinion. And it's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. That's telecast-podcast.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in Dubrovnik. 
So until next Thursday, as always, stay safe.